What's up, YouTube? Thanks for tuning in. You are about to check out a live fireside chat I did with Noma Met. He is the former U.S. ambassador to Argentina. We got a chance to talk about technology, innovation, the current political and economic climate, some of the concerns that he has for Argentina and for the United States. So I hope you like it. Make sure to like, share, and subscribe, and much love. Let me get started in just a couple uh, moments here. I'll let a few people roll in. Thanks so much for coming, everyone. So how are we doing, Noah? We're doing great. I'm doing really well uh, managing this, uh, the situation that we're in. So I, I was commenting to you, you got a, you got a, a cool studio back there. I'm, I'm, I'm envious. Uh, thank you. I, I, got a, I got creative and I turned my guest room into my, uh, you know, my quarantine studio. I figured we're going to probably be here for more than a few months. So get comfortable, get the sound and, you know, do my content here. That's great. Well, thanks for having me. Thank you. So uh, you've been keeping really busy. Tell us about, um, you know, what you've been up to. And I, I mean, I know you're obviously fundraising for Biden, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, but I feel like every time we've connected during quarantine, you're, you're, you're engaged in a lot of different activities. So tell us what's been going on. Sure. Well, look, at things have slowed, obviously, because I was going back and forth between the states and then not just Argentina, but uh, Brazil quite a bit, Mexico. Um, and since leaving uh, my position, uh, working for the government, being a U.S. ambassador to Argentina. Um, I took a little downtime and then decided to uh, work and consult for some major companies like Amazon Web Services and Disney uh, and a few others. Uh, but, but really looking for other interesting opportunities as well throughout Latin America. Uh, the law firm DLA Piper, which I know you know, mm -hmm. um, have a big presence there and help them acquire a firm in Buenos Aires, we rebranded it DLA Piper, and now I'm a senior advisor uh, to them uh, for Latin America in general. But um, so there's a lot of individual projects I've been working on, but one of the fun ones that I really enjoy is there's a company called MicroPower that uh, was started by the guy who ran Tesla Energy Storage, uh, that, that part of the company, the energy oh, wow. storage side. And so he, he started uh, this company in, in Sao Paulo, and, uh, I became uh, really involved with him. Basically, it's big battery storage, industrial, commercial size. And, um, and what we're trying to do is find places where there's a big differential between peak and off-peak pricing. And so in Sao Paulo, in, in Uruguay, which you know really well, yep. there's a big arena there in Montevideo, for example. Uh, so it is like an eight to one difference between peak pricing of energy and off peak. So we're powering up these batteries and then these companies are using them like McDonald's and, and others. So Amazing. a lot of the interesting stuff like that, but it's a lot harder when you're, when you're stuck here. I, I can imagine. I, I totally get it. And for those still kind of coming in, um, you know, some real big quick background I got to meet Noah last year in Argentina. Uh, we found out we were both from the same city, Manhattan Beach, California, LA uh, Angelinos. He went to USC. I went to Loyola and got to really have a strong connection about all the amazing innovation and, and technology that's been going on in, in Latin America. And Noah has been working with some clients in private sector. I think you've got a, a winery, a wine business you were working on as well. Yeah, um, so. Yeah. You know Mendoza, and uh, I love the region and the area uh, in the Bache de Uco, this one, this one uh, area within Mendoza, the province. Yep. So I have a, a little winery producing wine and uh, commercialized it in Buenos Aires. So uh, next time uh, someone goes to a top restaurant or a hotel in Buenos Aires, uh, it may be on the wine menu. So. Amazing. What's it like being a gringo in Argentina or doing business in Argentina? I love the country. I mean, it's a big country, as you well know, but yep. uh, uh, great people. I mean, unfortunately, they're going through a hard time. Again, it's a very serious recession that some of your, your folks may be following. I'm not sure. Yep. Um, uh, it's, it, but it's just a, a fantastic country. There's so many things to do. One of the things when I was at the embassy we really worked on was increasing travel and tourism. And uh, as you know, being from L.A., we, we uh, helped uh, American Airlines get a nonstop direct uh, from the West Coast, from Los Angeles to Buenos Aires, the first time in, uh, I think, 18, 19 years. Changed my life, yeah. <laughs> that flight. <laughs> a lot of people who take that flight uh, enjoy it, but we also helped United with another route uh, going from Newark, New Jersey, direct nonstop mm -hmm. to Buenos Aires. So uh, that, those were just two examples of what we were trying to do to help 
travel and tourism both ways that would help both countries. And unfortunately, right now, um, you know, they've announced, I'm not sure it's going to hold, but they've announced that there'll be no uh, passenger travel um, till like September. Yeah, which is, I think one of the most draconian measures anywhere in the world right now. So, you know, they may revisit that, but uh, uh, there's a lot of angst about how how the whole country has been shut down, but so dramatically, you can't even, Buenos Aires, you can't leave your house within 500 meters without a, basically like a certificate uh, from the government that allows you to do that. Mm. So um, maybe some of that has been, has been really good because they've had very few cases, um, especially relative to Brazil, which you may have followed, which is also, which is increasing at a, yep. a very alarming rate right now. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's crazy. And I, I, I think to some degree, you know, from the mitigation perspective, this is something they have to do, especially if they want to start opening up parts of their economy in their country is they're going to have to close off a lot of the travel from within the country and, and other parts. But it's, you know, it's extreme. And, you know, when I was flying that American, that L, the LA to Buenos Aires uh, afternoon flight, it was, it wasn't, you know, it was starting to like pick up some momentum, but it wasn't a busy flight yet. And I'm, you know, I, I worry, you know this better than anyone, how hit, how hard the tourism is going to be hit from all this. Absolutely. And, and they were doing well, uh, the, the hotels, especially yep. down there uh, before, before this hit. And, and, and one big reason is because the exchange rate, which, Ben, I know you know very, very well, and how that's a real opportunity because, you know, when I first got there, the official rate, uh, I think was like eight to one uh, pesos to dollar. Yep. The unofficial, they call it the blue dollar, I think it was 14 to one. Now the actual oh. rate is what, 70 something. To over, one. I think, official. And then I think the, 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 the black market is over a hundred, I think. Yeah. So. So, so the power of what you get for your dollar, I think has obviously uh, gone directly to increasing tourism uh, in the country. So, so this is obviously a, a major hit just as they were slowly trying to at least get out of a recession, which, you know, has been, uh, has been a long time, too long, unfortunately. Now, what years were you in Argentina? So I arrived January 15th, of 2015, mm -hmm. and I was there uh, only two years and four days because uh, mm -hmm. I left as all ambassadors left on Inauguration Day uh, on January 20th of 2017. And you, were, you had an opportunity to stay, but you didn't want to stay under Trump's administration. Not exactly. No, no one uh, was given that opportunity. And frankly, uh, those of us that we call our non-career uh, are appointed by the president, which are most of the G20 countries. Um, I don't know that anybody necessarily would have stayed because such a dramatic uh, change of administration and, and, and you're the personal representative of the president. And I'm not sure, at least speaking for myself, I didn't, I didn't want to represent the administration because I thought their views would be uh, uh, 180 degrees different than the last administration. So you, I mean, you were instrumental in bringing the, that American flight from LA to Argentina. What other things were you doing on the private sector in terms of helping with the knowledge export? And, you know, tell us a little bit about that region as well, just from a tech and innovation standpoint. Sure. Actually, uh, even this morning, there's a WhatsApp group that was started by the, the group that I took. There were 30 Argentines that I took to California. And sometimes like friends of mine down there joke that I was the ambassador from California <laughs> uh, because I use so many examples around, you know, technology and innovation and renewable energy and, and California uh, being a leader on those. Um, so I took this group uh, to California and they're still together in this big WhatsApp group. They communicate uh, every day, multiple times a day. And basically the idea was to focus on those three things, uh, was technology, innovation, and renewable energy. And we came for one week. And embassies typically don't do stuff like this, but you know my background, I was an entrepreneur, but always involved in politics. Yep. And so, um, sorry, I turned this off. And so when I brought them to Los Angeles, uh, we went to the largest solar farm in the United States, owned by Berkshire Hathaway uh, in Lancaster. Uh, we took them to uh, Solar Reserve, which is an amazing thing. If you ever fly over Las Vegas or if you drive outside of the city, you'll see these three big columns and thousands yep. of solar panels, right? And it heats up the salt, which then drives the turbines, and uh, it powers most of Las Vegas now. 
Uh, we took them to up north to the Tesla manufacturing facility in Fremont. We went to Autodesk, uh, which is an amazing showroom in, in, in San Francisco, Stanford Research Institute, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the whole idea was to try to build these bridges between not just California, but the U.S. on technology and innovation and renewable energy. And, their secret and, and so the really important, half of them were from the private sector, half mm -hmm. of them were from the government. And so, you know, when we're checking into the hotel in, in L.A., the day we arrived, there was a guy that came up to me and said, you know, Ambassador, this is a great success. And Ben, I said, we haven't done anything yet. <laughs> he said, no, you don't understand. He said, the government and the private sector had never worked together. They, had, they really didn't communicate. Uh, so the fact that they're sharing buses and vans and traveled on planes, you know, back when we could travel on planes yeah, together. Yeah. Uh, he said, they're making all these relationships and, and building these bonds between the private and the public sector. So it was, a, it was just one example of the kinds of innovative things we tried to do. Um, and we put a, you know, wind turbine at the embassy. We put solar panels, uh, the first embassy in Argentina, uh, to have solar panels, we had a, uh, something you were familiar with, uh, 3D printers, <laughs> first embassy in the world to bring a 3D printer in. Not that it necessarily was something we really needed, uh, uh, but it was as an example of, of embracing technology and then trying to come up with ideas and ways to utilize it um, and, and also to bring kids in and, and show them the future and show them how to program. So we did try to do a lot of things well, in, within the innovation technology and renewable energy. No, I love that. And, you know, if, it, if there wasn't a time for 3D printing a couple years ago, I mean, now, now is the time. I mean, we're seeing the open source work with 3D printing ventilators. And, you know, a lot of people don't know that Argentina was, is still one of the um, kind of top communities for open source programming languages. So a lot of the work that uh, I learned from when I was learning this business and engineering it all came from that region, Argentina and Uruguay. Um, so it, you know, it, it's a it's a really amazing community of tech people, and a lot of people. I think you, it's farming, asados, you know, a lot of the other things, but they don't think about the technology side. And you know, renewable energy. I know is something you've worked on and you're passionate about. Um, what are your thoughts with? Did you ever think you'd see the kind of destruction destruction of the oil economy? No, and as you know, there's this place called Vaca Muerta, which, which, uh, which is oil and gas potential, right? And so even our own, the U.S. Department of Energy, um, uh, their estimates were that this one region in Argentina had potentially the second largest shale, um, shale gas deposits in the world and the fourth largest shale oil deposits in the world. The problem is getting to it and mm. how much investment, I mean, tens and probably hundreds of billions of dollars that needs to get invested in that area. But at the same time, um, you know, the, at least the Macri administration was really focused on renewables and they did some really smart things. And, and one of the attendees to California on the trip that I was telling you about was the secretary of renewable energy, uh, Sebastian Keene, who's a brilliant young guy who won all these global awards for the way they structured their bidding process. And so um, because these are 30 year, you know, agreements uh, and everybody's concerned about Argentina that seems to have these booms and busts every 10 years, they structured in such a way that ultimately the World Bank was the ultimate backup. And there, mm -hmm. before that was a sovereign fund and before that was like the provincial fund, I believe. And then before that was Camesa. So they had all these ways. So people, it increased the confidence that people would get paid. So they, they tried to do a lot to really increase renewable energies. You know, when, ben, when I got there, there was less than 1% of their energy, less than one came from renewables. And I think at the end of this year, at least it was scheduled to be something like 12% wow. or, you know, 11%. So massive growth. Unfortunately, I'm very concerned the current government has not embraced that. And in many ways, is trying, it, it looks like is, is somewhat maybe dismantling it. We'll have to wait and see uh, what happens. But it was a big concern because I think we as a U.S. Embassy and the U.S. government really tried to bring experts down in all these fields and, and people who were retired uh, that came out of solar or came out of wind to help them structure this stuff. So, so going back to your question about oil and gas, you know, which has these major uh, uh, ups and downs and, you know, what we see going on right now, 
it's a huge problem be- for Argentina if they're betting on Vaca Muerta mm-hmm. because the investments won't be there if, if oil companies aren't making money, um, w- which right now is, is very tough. So, and, yeah. No, and that was going to, and, and that, and also, you know, defaulting on their treasury bills, obviously a lot of debt to the IMF. Um, you know, these are things that you probably had were concerns about during your time there, but you know, now this could become a reality. Yeah, look at they're they're close to default. Uh, they're they're you know in major talks on on uh, what they're going to do with their debt, both the IMF and the private sector. Um, and you know we'll, we'll see. And then coronavirus hits. So on top mm-hmm. of everything else, um, it does look like at least the IMF is has been pretty cooperative. It seems at least on their public yeah. statements. It just from what I've read in in the press. Um, so we'll we'll see how it goes going forward. But it's a, look at it's a major concern. They've got a lot of debt. Uh, but the idea was to grow their way out of it. But if you if they're stuck in recession, um, it's you know it, it's very hard. How important is cooperation right now between banks, between lenders, between governments? I mean, I, I don't know if we're the best role model <laughs> between the two, the very the very polarizing sides in our country. But just in terms of the rest of the world, how important is it to you know work together on this? Uh, it's very important. And I'll give you an example. So, so about 37, 38% of the economy of Argentina is tied to Brazil. Hmm. Um, and, and also in major sectors like manufacturing and autos, uh, you know, right now people aren't buying cars, um, uh, but they will again. But what happens is, you know, b- both countries suffer, but especially because Brazil is so big, it yep. has, we would say like throw weight. It, it, it's just so big that in Argentina, uh, is so tied to it that they used to say if you know Brazil catches you know a cold and, and Argentina gets pneumonia yeah. and so so there was a silver lining you know about when we came in and we were helping the market administration in the first sort of dip of their economy um, they were forced to look at other markets and I remember going to the Ford manufacturing plant outside of uh, the city of Buenos Aires and they said because uh, of Brazil being at minus five percent two years in a row of their GDP, that Ford, which manufactures trucks in Argentina that used to be sold in Brazil, mm. they were forced to find new markets and they were selling into Mexico for the first time. So, so it did in some ways kind of force them to not rely on Brazil as much. But there's no question, um, you know, Brazil's a major uh, actor in, the, in, in sort of the economy of Argentina. That's just one example, but there's many. Yeah, and it's, I mean, they're, that's a whole other crazy situation too with just Bolsonaro and, um, you know, what's happening in there. Let me, let me ask you, because you're the expert on Uruguay, which is tucked between the two. Uh, you know, what, what are your thoughts if you don't just give me, you know, your, your top line on, on Uruguay right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, from a community standpoint, it, everything seems quite phenomenal how people are responding and kind of getting each other's back. I don't know if they're still sheltering in place. I'm sure some people are getting, you know, kind of restless. Um, but a lot of my friends have been creating content for the government, promoting the, um, you know, how to wear a face mask and why you should wear a face mask and just a lot of support, you know, and it, it created a lot of really interesting feelings for me. Like why, why is it so hard to do that in this country? And, also, why a place like Sweden might be able to do herd immunity is because people listen to the government. So if they say don't do social distance or do social distancing, you know, stay six feet apart. These are the guidelines. Generally, people respect their government and they listen. And I think that's the challenge with the United States. It's a very big country and a lot of other places. They're having to, the last I heard, they're having to um, cut off a lot of travel as well. I think you'll be able to go to, through Colombia. Um, but you know, going in and out is going to be very, very difficult. So maybe Avianca, um, I think American airlines and the Miami Montevideo route has been cut off, um, indefinitely. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a very difficult challenge for everybody, but I would say the people in our world in our sector have done quite well because we're very much insulated from a lot of these challenges working remotely already, well distributed. So working from home is not really something new. Productivity has probably been higher in the last couple months. I think so many people don't want to deal with the world around them. They don't want to go and subscribe to the news and what's going on or, you know, even family issues. So work has been a a healthy path for them and, you know, doing what they love, which is design and development and all sorts of things. 
Um, you know, I think the big challenge for the industry as a whole is, you know, fighting the commoditization of it, you know, where Euro and, and the dollars are, are very close. So now what Uruguay and Argentina will have to do will be really compete with the Eastern Europe and the India on price wars for software. So I, I don't think the demand necessarily is going to change a lot. It will in some places for sure in the startup ecosystem, but everybody, you know, is going to be cutting profits, even Jeff Bezos. So the next six to 12 months, I think are going to get really interesting. I'm more concerned about the, how quickly we get back and going. In other words, when we, it all of a sudden becomes back to normal and the, the switch is on and we're doing our normal lives, we're like, oh, well, you know, Corona was so last year. That's the thing that scares me the most, you know, and that's when, it, when is that stock market going to crash and plunge? When does the hyperinflation kick in? When are we going to start seeing the sort of repercussions of the trillions that we've been printing? So those are the things that I'm more worried about. I think we'll all get through this. It's just nobody really has the data of how long this is going to take to recover and you know, of course, this, if there's going to be multiple waves, Uruguay and Argentina specifically are very concerned going into flu season, winter weather, um, you know, whether there will be a second wave, which is also why I think they're probably taking such drastic measures to, you know, spread transmit or contain the transmission. So, you know, we'll see. It's, I think everyone in every country is making the decisions by the day. You know, you, you read a lot of the stuff on the internet, the conspiracy theories and People are like, oh, this is the master plan and the, the, um, the deep state has been doing this all along. Like, these guys are literally making decisions by the day. Like, yeah, Garcetti yeah. and team are crunching data just like everybody else, and they're deciding they want to, you know, open up safely again. But it's – we're learning. This is something that's evolving. The actual virus evolves. The whole thing evolves. So it's, it's going to be an interesting one. You, you know, um, I, I agree with all that. It reminds me two, two things. One on um, – the informal economy, you know, within Latin America is so big that, you know, you have uh, these mom and pop restaurants, for example, yep. uh, and are people going to go back uh, to a place where there's a question on, you know, hygiene and cleanliness yep. versus, you know, we're friends with uh, the owners of McDonald's uh, in Latin America, where they can have across the board, you know, systems in place, right, on, yep. on hygiene and cleanliness. Uh, versus the mom and pops and, uh, uh, restaurants, which I, I'm, you know, very worried. Like many of those will go under. The, but the informal economy in, in every industry yeah. is so big in Latin America that um, I think they're going to have a much uh, bigger challenge in many ways than, than the states. The, the other thing, uh, you know, I, I would say, and you know this very well, and, and you saw the, this happening years ago, uh, the technology in Buenos Aires. And, you know, if we want to sort of also see silver linings on this, um, you know, when I arrived there, this was a few years ago, I think there were only six unicorns in all of Latin America, and four of those six actually came from Buenos Aires. Hmm. It was pretty amazing when you think about the size of Brazil and Mexico. Yeah. And so um, th those numbers now have, have grown, I think, in Latin America. But, but at least when I arrived, four out of the six in Buenos Aires really goes to show you the um, really robust <laughs> Uh, tech uh, ecosystem yep. in, in Buenos Aires in particular. And because once you had one or two or three uh, unicorns, like I think they really helped a lot of the other companies around them. And so that ecosystem really grew. And I do think if there, you know, is a hope and a route out of not just their recession, but maybe a post corona mm -hmm. world, it probably comes back in some part to technology and their ability to, to grow quickly. I have one question on that. So a lot of technologists actually from Argentina and Uruguay are on this call. Uh, one of the main benefits of exporting knowledge in these regions, if you live there or have a business there, is some of the tax credits, which I'm sure you're familiar with. In Argentina, if you export to the United States, you don't have to pay the local taxes. Do you think the government will be able to continue to do that, given all the debt and all the changes that have gone on because of coronavirus? Well, as you know, the, the industry is very worried about that. And, 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 you know, one of the challenges in Argentina and look at, frankly, many countries in Latin America is the lack of stability and predictability uh, from government to government. Yeah. And, and look at, you could say that about the U.S. too, uh, in some yeah. way, right? Yeah. But we're just so big. It, it's like we're a big aircraft carrier and to turn it around, even if you have a president who wants to do that and is trying to do that, it still takes a while to turn it around. Uh, in Argentina, though, 
you know, this new government compared to the last government um, has doing things very dramatically different. And, and I look at, I know many families that have, that have moved to Uruguay because of the, yep. the current tax and, and what they think is coming. Um, it's, it's good for Uruguay and Jose Ignacio and Punta del Este, <laughs> but uh, I don't, it's not good for the tax base of the province or the city of Buenos Aires. Yep. So, so I think there's major concern um, on not just wealth tax, but on export tax. Uh, and, and, you know, I work closely with um, the meat exporters. Uh, that one of the things that we did was we opened up the market in the U.S. for Argentine beef for the first time in 20 years. Oh, wow. Uh, but they opened up the market for uh, U.S. pork. So we're again, we're trying to build those bridges. Um, you know, it's a real challenge because under Christina, there was a 90, I think it was about like a 90% tax on beef to be, if it was exported. The reason it was very intentional was to almost prevent the export, to reduce mm -hmm. the price domestically, which they thought ultimately would, you know, help uh, when they're looking for votes in their voting base yeah. so by keeping the price of, of, of beef down within the country. So all of those issues around tax and import, export, exchange rates, currency controls, you know, those are kind of the ghosts of the past of, of Argentina, which have kind of risen again. Hmm. And we'll probably be learning about that in our country too. I mean, we're all going to be getting um, a bit of an education. You, it sounds like you've got an incredible one during your time in Argentina in economics and macroeconomics. And now we'll probably be learning some of that too in the next couple of years. You know, there's a reason why there's a disproportionate number of Argentines on Wall Street. I don't know if any are on this call, but you, you just go walk around Wall Street, you go to any bank, any investment company, there will be a disproportionate amount of Argentines there. And the reason, the kind of the, the joke amongst themselves is they got PhDs in economics <laughs> just by growing up in yeah. Argentina and the exchange rates and the fluctuations and everything else. They're very, very smart, but they're, they're really good at finance in part because they have to be to survive yeah. in some ways. But um, anyhow, it just it reminded me of that. Interesting stuff. So let's talk about this week. You've got um, you've been fundraising on Zoom, which is incredible. Because we were talking about this, the challenges with fundraising, and you got to schmooze, you got to go to lunches. Now we could do it. You know, I'm wearing a nice shirt, but I'm wearing sweatpants over here, so we could literally do it in our sweatpants. What has it been like raising for Biden's campaign, and what are your plans for working with them, and what can you share? Sure. So I'm spending a lot of time on it because I have time because uh, I'm not on planes, you know, like you going back and forth to, to Latin. But so um, I'm uh, as a volunteer, I'm just doing this as a, as a volunteer uh, and I'm doing everything I can to help him. I really want to desperately want to see this change. Uh, I, I know him well. Um, Vice President Biden actually swore me in in the White House uh, in, in the second term before I actually went to the post. Um, he's got a great family and, and uh, his wife actually came and visited Argentina on an official trip to talk with teachers. Uh, we were promoting exchange programs between the Argentina and the US. Um, so I know them well and I think he would make a great president, uh, no question in my mind. So I'm doing everything I can to help. So yeah, uh, we're, we're fundraising from Zoom. I wasn't sure how it was gonna go to tell you the truth because uh, I've done a lot of this over the years but it's always in person as you said. There is this like amazing uh, benefit, which is yeah. you don't have to, especially like, let's say you, we live in LA, yeah. we're on the West side, like to have to get in your car and drive yeah. across town. No, it's on amazing. Thursday, and then go through security checks, right? Go through yeah. the maps and go to the event. By the time I get back, I live on the old, you know, on the West side at the beach. That's a four hour turn. Easy, right? So this way it's 60 minutes on the dot. So here's the pitch for a little bit for yep. Friday. Uh, so this Friday we're going to do another one and he's been doing them. Uh, from his uh, his basement uh, studio, like your studio, mm -hmm. uh, although he doesn't have the Kobe in the background, uh, <laughs> but uh, but he's been doing this, and they're gone really well. And he takes questions uh, from people, and and I think also the interesting thing I didn't realize is normally when you 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 uh, donate to a campaign, like you said, there's an event, and mm -hmm. and usually you know one person per donation, let's say. In this instance, you know if someone contributes to the campaign. Um, their spouse can sit in or their mm -hmm. kids can sit in. Yeah. And so a lot of them are bringing their kids into the picture. And it's kind of like a civics lesson in a way of, you know, Vice President Biden. And on Friday, we're actually going to have uh, Governor Newsom as well. Gavin Newsom will be on the call. Nice. Uh, the video. And then David Pluff, uh, who was the campaign manager for Obama, uh, senior advisor in the Obama White House as well. Um, so there's going to be the three of them on this video conference at 4 p.m. Pacific 
on Friday. And so it's gone really well. I did one uh, a couple weeks ago with the vice president and uh, Senator Cory Booker, who's a, a good personal friend of mine from New Jersey. And like I said, it went great. So hopefully some of your people are interested in helping the campaign. And it, 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 it went really, it's, it's going really well. So I think people will enjoy it. I think virtual fundraisers and these types of meetings, they're going to continue to advance a lot. My friend is producing the, the annual 9-11 Foundation in September, yeah. uh, obviously, you know, 9-11. And Bloomberg does it every year, $25,000 fundraisers. He's like, we have money to spend, but we don't know what to do because we can't cancel it. And I said, start sending really good camera equipment to people. Send the little portal from Facebook. It's an amazing camera. It pans and zooms. You send people like a swag box, wine and cheese. So... I, I, have you guys been thinking about this or like what direction does fundraising go with this? I'm taking some good notes here. Man. Those, <laughs> I'll those send are you really, this is a really good idea. Um, so I, honestly, it's, they're, they're, you know, they're building the plane as they're flying it right yeah. now. I mean, no one's ever done this. When I was talking to the vice president, he said, you know, this is by far the longest in his life, his adult life that he hasn't traveled and maybe like us, but, but even more so when you're running for president, right? I mean, you're in two or three States some days, in a single 24 hour period. And so the fact that you're sort of, you're not out there uh, in a rope line and you're not out there giving speech and you're not shaking hands is just radically different, but um, than what they're used to their whole lives. So honestly, I think we're learning how to do this. Um, mm -hmm. The campaign is, um, I don't think the Trump campaign has done that yet, but they have a big advantage right now because he didn't have a primary. He's got a $300 million advantage right now. And, and, and when Biden won the nomination, you know, he was virtually broke and he had a skeleton staff mm. to his credit. He still won the nomination. And so they really have to sort of uh, scale up uh, big and dramatically and fast. No. And, and there's been many studies over the years that um, uh, the, the few undecided voters that exist anymore, they, a lot of times they, whether they know it or not, they kind of make their minds up. Uh, at least their perceptions get formed. Uh, four or five, six months before election date, mm -hmm. in large part around the economy. So because this is, in, we're in such turmoil, nobody really knows what's going to happen. But the reason I'm uh, asking people to get involved in now, as opposed to three, four months from yeah. now, is because this is when you need to scale. Basically, yeah. you're building a, a over a billion dollar operation from scratch, in their case, in six months. And, and, and you need the front end is really key. And you've got Trump traveling still. So, I mean, that's another major disadvantage and why this needs to scale up now. It, exactly. So we'll see. I think it's Arizona. And so we'll see how that goes. But I can't imagine. Uh, but may, a, he does a lot of things I can't imagine. But uh, whether he'll have a lot of interaction with people or will be, you know, up on a stage or farther away. Or most of it's going to be to drive local media is, is, yeah. my, is my guess. Got it. All right, well, let's jump into some questions. So uh, for everyone that's posted, thank you very much for that. And uh, if you want to continue, we'll answer them uh, in the order they come in. This one's from Mateo. There are polarizing opinions on globalization today, with some saying it is dying, some saying it will increase. What is your view on outsourcing of services with the recession in the US and the appeal for cheaper talent in Latin America, uh, sp especially Argentina, Uruguay? Are you sure you're not Mateo, Ben? Because that sounds like a softball to you for what you, <laughs> for what you do. I look at I think there's huge growth opportunity uh, in Latin America. Um, I'll give you one example about Argentina and Buenos Aires, okay? So my friend who runs uh, J.P. Morgan Chase um, in, in Argentina, he, he had told me a story, and he said it publicly, so I'll repeat it, that you know when he went to go convince Jamie Dimon, this was now like five years ago, that – Buenos Aires is the place they should put hmm. their service center. Not, not a, you know, this is a higher end where if you're in New York and you're a customer, I think in you uh, of, Mar you know, of JP and you want information on Microsoft or something, that research now gets done in Buenos Aires. And he had to go convince Jamie Dimon to do this. And Jamie's like, are you crazy? All I read are bad headlines about Argentina. And he said, no, no, let, let, hear me out. And he, over 20, 30 minutes, he convinced him. Number one, there's a, a uh, high level of human talent. And that's the main thing that Fortune 5, you know, 100, Fortune 100 companies look for, right? Is, is human talent. Uh, number two, uh, English is a second language. Very, yep. very high, and you know this, Uruguay as well, but in particular, Buenos Aires. Number three, only one hour difference to the East Coast much of the year. 
And so as opposed to India and some other places, you know, having that, that, that time zone is, is, is helpful in addition to the language, in addition to the high level of human talent. So look at, I think that'll continue to be uh, technology, a good place for, for people to, to expand into. I mean, look at, I wasn't advocating for companies to leave the US, it, but uh, I wanted them to expand and vice versa in more partnership opportunities. And, yeah. and you're really the expert on that. So I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah, I mean, creating, like you said, partnerships, extension. If it's not going to be in Latin America, it's going to be in Eastern Europe or it's going to be in India. Yeah. So there's just there's a, a really high level talent community in these places. And I'm not saying that we don't have that in the US, but we don't have enough of it in the US. So in order to compete at the at the Google and the Facebook level, ta talent is global. And we need to open our eyes to that. And I'm hoping we don't see policies that change some of the way, uh, you know, business has done in the last 10 years or make it more restrictive or harder. But I think that, um, no, I mean, I think outsourcing is a huge business and it's powering a lot of the world right now. And it, it's because of outsourcing that I think health committees and people are able to get landing page and information and email marketing systems up and running during, uh, you know, during a pandemic. So it's yeah, one of the few yeah, industries... Yeah. It, and the seasons are opposite, right? Yeah, and so we exactly. Have the advantage of right now, they're 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 not suffering the way we're suffering. They're worried about what's coming. Uh, but this is what you said is a perfect opportunity when you have a global crisis like this. Sometimes you need the southern hemisphere. Sometimes you need a different time zone. You know, yep. we just don't know what that crisis is going to be. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, this one's anonymous. As someone who is active in politics and business, how do you feel the stage of politics in this pandemic environment is ch changing for the better or worse? Uh, that's a good question. We could probably talk uh, for a long time about that. Um, uh, we are, it's no secret, sort of more polarized than, I don't want to say than ever. We had a civil war, uh, people forget. Um, and so, you know, obviously we have this, uh, sort of balkanized uh, information streams, um, which is part of the problem. It's reinforcing people's, uh, you know, uh, preconceived notions. So I don't know that it's going to change much. I mean, one of the big concerns was that, that Trump would, the president would um, sort of p make more partisan this crisis. And, and you saw that in his tweets, right? And, yeah. and, and what people didn't realize when he's saying, you know, liberate Virginia or Michigan, or he's actually on Twitter saying something that's completely counter to his own administration's guidelines. Hmm. Um, the White House guidelines, the, White, the task force guidelines, what he was telling people to do, which was go protest and, and disregard you know, social distancing, was counter to his own White House. So he, look, at, he lives in chaos. It's no secret, right? He loves it and he needs it, I think. Um, but I also think the Oval Office is the last place that we should have chaos. I'll, and I'll just one, I'll end with this. You know, when I was in Argentina, I kind of I realized something that Madeleine Albright, our former Secretary of State said, that the US is the one indispensable nation. And she didn't mean to say that in a way to, to brag about the US, but it was something I, I sort of found out and I realized once you're representing the US overseas, and I think many would, would say this, that any country, if they have a huge crisis, um, they're going to try to deal with it on their own. I'm talking about an earthquake or a nuclear meltdown. Um, at, but at the end of the day, I think what they want is the ability to pick up the phone and sort of break glass and call the White House. And in some ways, I think ambassadors around the world are that lifeline back to the Oval Office, which, which is why we need predictability and stability in that oval um, because other countries rely on it. We don't, we can't be the policemen of the world. We can't fix all the problems, but if, you know, Japan has a nuclear meltdown, if there's a, you know, earthquake in Chile, if there's, you know, uh, et cetera, if there's crisis around the world um, or Ebola in Africa, many times, and hopefully not all the time, the U.S. is sort of there as a last resort. And yeah. I think that's what's so critical. So I'll answer that question, just, uh, I'll finish just by saying, look, we need, we need to be more predictable, more stable, to be able to help countries around the world and strengthen our alliances. I completely agree. And you know, for there's a lot of people here, I, I presuming in South America, because there's a lot of uh, international names that I'm seeing. Uh, and 
you know, the one thing that is big, a big challenge for Americans right now is the, the information problem we have. It's very, very difficult. It's, you know, for, for we're, Noah and I are two smart guys and I don't think we know what the current guidelines are. It's changing by the minute and it changes on the city, on the state, on the national level. And the president is doing national or daily press briefings and it's completely different than what our local governments are saying and then that changes. So, um, you know, that's the, the, the data and the information is a really important thing. And if you're in technology, you know how important it is. And that's something we're gonna have to have a, an ongoing fight for is battling fake news, the information game and, you know, and all that. Yeah, and, and I, I don't think that's what people want. I mean, they want consistency. They want predictability. They want to be able, to, in times like this, to have a consistent voice. And so, you know, being able to coordinate and cooperate was so key. I think we maybe saw that a little bit at the beginning, but unfortunately, I think that's frayed. All right, this is a good one. Do you think surveys are accurate? If we go back in time, Trump, Brexit, et cetera, feels media goes one way or the other, depending on editorial views, and sometimes they get on a feedback loop with like-minded people. Do you think this will be different in 2020? So polling has taken a massive hit, I would say, these last uh, eight years. Uh, Brexit is a good example. It was kind of the first one that was uh, so surprising. Even though there was polling that showed it close, it definitely did not reflect ultimately the, the final result from what people thought would happen. Trump's another example, but look at Argentina. You know, Macri won when he wasn't supposed to five years ago, and then he lost. Uh, last year by a margin that, well, first in the Faso, where uh, his initial sort of loss, it gets a little complicated, but your Argentine friends understand it, was much bigger than people thought. And that's where the big sell-off happened for Argentina. Um, and then anyhow, you see all around the world polling not being accurate as, as the end result. I don't think people want to pick up their phone uh, is a big problem. Polling used to happen by landlines. And if you're under 40 years old now, maybe under 50. Well, not a lot of people have landlines anymore. Um, so that's a big problem. I don't think the science has been figured out of how to accurately pull online. I mean, it's been, it's been tried and it's getting better, you know, over the last five, six, eight years. But I just think there's a, the margin of error, we call it, is, is pretty big. Um, it used to always be like plus or minus two and a half percent, three percent, as long as you had about 1,100, 1,200 people, the scientific analysis. Now, look at, I, I, I do look at it occasionally. I think it's a snapshot in time, but I think also people change their mind quickly. So you have a combination of problems. You have so much information, um, people change their minds, people don't pick up the phones. And so, you know, polling is very inaccurate. And, and I know people, you know, love to, to read polls and predict the future, but I think it's really hard. And right now we're, Trump's probably hovering around a 40% approval rate. Yeah, I mean, what's amazing is, you know, he, he has a very, they say a very high floor and a very low ceiling. Yeah. I mean, he just operates in this, you know, 38, 39 on the low, 42, 43 on the high, and he is right in there. I mean, you know, there were many, well, there were a handful of states that he won going, you know, back to the election that he did not get 50% on. Mm. Um, we had third party candidates that got one, two or 3%. Um, and that makes the difference. This election is going to be really close. There's only 10, 11 states uh, that are swing states, probably that could go one way or another. And those are many of those are going to be right on the margin. I mean, if you go back and think about Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, those three states combined, um, Hillary lost by 70,000 votes among if you combine those three states, Michigan, she lost by 11,000 votes, I believe. Wow. Um, and it's just going to get closer and, and closer. Wisconsin, everybody, both sides will tell you, is going to be a coin flip on election day. And so that's kind of ground zero, I think, for, for the election. Now, historically, though, in our country, whether it's 2008, you know, Gulf War, even Vietnam, the incumbent usually has higher than 40% approval ratings, right? It should be like around an 80. So let's hope... Let's hope that means that he loses in November. But we don't, we don't ever really know with this guy. You know, historically, I mean, for decades, the, the standard was, are you above 50 or below 50? Hmm. If you're below 50 going into a re-election, uh, you're most likely you are going to lose that. 
Um, and so, and in terms of uh, approval, disapproval, this is a little, this is a different world today. I mean, um, and they're like, if you just look at those raw numbers in a historical context, uh, he should not win. Uh, there's almost no way in a historical context. The difference is his base is so motivated and he's able to bring people who normally don't vote. Um, and so the Democratic well, Biden uh, has to be able to do the same, which is increase uh, the voter turnout in the Democratic base. So that's African Americans, Hispanics, suburban women, and 18 to 29 year olds. I mean, the Democrats won back the House of Representatives a year and a half ago because of the 18 to 29 year olds. I think it like close to doubled the turnout in an off year. A lot, a lot of that around guns. Um, the anti sort of gun um, yeah. sentiment with young people was a major driver, uh, among other things. But those four key uh, components to the Democratic base, I think, will determine the election. We shall see. All right, last two questions. Uh, this one is also Mateo. What is your biggest advice for entrepreneurs in Latin America that want to get into the U.S.? Do you need a leg in the U.S. doing sales there, or is it possible to sell from Latam even if it is all virtual nowadays? All right, well, you're going to have to jump in a little bit on this. All right, one, you, you go first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. Uh, look, when I took that group uh, to Silicon Valley, I mean, we heard a lot from VCs uh, that came to meet with us. And, and their point of view, which, which I don't know if you agree with, but that the founders ultimately, you know, need to spend some time in, in Northern California or Silicon Beach now, which is, which is L.A., right? Um, and maybe not right away, you had to get some traction, you had to have some sort of growth, some sales. At the end of the day, what they cared about, uh, what we heard over and over and over, uh, was not profitability, but was growth. Um, at least that's what the VCs, and you know, this was pre-corona, but that's what they wanted to see was, was huge growth, but they also wanted sort of the core team, not right away, but eventually to be closer to them uh, in, in Silicon Valley where they can help mentor. We heard that a lot. So, you know, I don't know if that answers the question, but do, what do you, do you agree with that? Or? I, no, I completely agree. I mean, even in, even in quarantine, which it sounds very odd to say this, but even in, in these circumstances, founders need to be spending time in, in Northern California, or Southern California, depending where their markets are. Um, and a lot of the big companies, uh, that we compete with in Uruguay, a lot of our frenemies, a lot of our peers, they're constantly doing three, six months in, in San Francisco and LA. So understanding the culture, it's the little things, as you know, in sales and business development, it's making a connection about favorite places to eat or you know what happened in the news today or what's going on in sports. And the more you distant, distance yourself, I, I find that you're, you're leaving money on the table and you're gonna be giving up you know, potential new revenue or profits. So I think uh, you have to have some founders spending time in the US and then, of course, you need to be doing business development in the United States as well. That can be, you know, work for hire people. It can be um, kind of strategic partnerships. I think we're going to start seeing a lot more of kind of, uh, you know, roll-ups or acquisitions with U.S. companies as well who want to look for, you know, talent in, in Latin America. And they can play kind of that front-end role. And they've got, you know, an engineering infrastructure. So, yeah, spend, spend time in the States. There you go. All right. Um, this is the last question. This one's anonymous. How is the election going to be affected this fall? How's it going to be affected? Yeah. Um, well, we don't know. Uh, true. I mean, no one could have guessed this situation. Uh, you know, Trump in his own mind was riding high into the reelection just a few months ago because his whole message was going to be the stock market. He would say the economy, but in effect, the stock market at record highs, unemployment at record lows, and that's it. Didn't really want to get into the fact that people were, you know, working two jobs or three jobs that, you know, wages were not, weren't keeping up with inflation. If you go back till 1980, uh, you know, uh, there are lots of indicators, healthcare costs are way up, education costs are way up, personal debt, especially around education is, is massive. But his whole message was going to be those two things. Now, you talk about, you know, unemployment. I think I heard this morning that, you know, because we've had uh, what, like 25 million people in the last six weeks apply for unemployment, it's the, it's the biggest amount since we've ever had record keeping, I believe, which included, you know, the Great Depression in terms of, you know, the, the six, six to eight weeks of, of uh, new filings for unemployment. 
Um, so massive change there. Uh, stock market obviously is a roller coaster right now, uh, but most people don't realize half of the American public, I believe, is not in the market. Um, and that's not how they per sort of see uh, what's happening in their local community, right? Um, and so I don't think we really know uh, how many other curveballs we'll see between now and then. Um, what the economy looks like for sure is always a driver on if a president gets reelected or not. Um, but you mentioned Ben, the, the you know goal, first goal four when Bush was at close to 90%. I think it was at 87% approval, and then a little bit over a year later, uh, he gets beat by Bill Clinton. And nobody saw that coming either. So, so I think we have to be, you know, a um, little humble and in, 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 in the outlook of we, we don't know what's going to happen. I, but the one thing we, we do know is it's going to be very close. There's, that's, there's no question about that. And I think a lot of people stayed home. Uh, Democrats did because they thought Hillary was going to win. Or maybe they just didn't love her as a candidate. Or, you know, you had FBI and you had Russian involvement. Sort of this perfect storm against her. Uh, I, and people just didn't think Trump would win. So I do think now uh, there's one added reason for people to vote. That said, and I'll leave it with this, one of the big challenges is you see Republican governors and legislators around the world, uh, I'm sorry, around the country doing all they can to make it harder to vote. And especially in a world of Corona, like we saw in Wisconsin, the Republicans refused to cooperate to postpone the election or to make it easier to vote by mail, uh, which is what we should have. So people don't have to risk their health in order to vote. Um, and this is going to be a major fight all like in many in many states around the country. Uh, Democrats want to make it easier to vote. And you see Trump and others trying to make it harder. So so that's another fight that doesn't get a lot of attention. But that that's going to have a difference because it's going to be very close. So if any of your your people on here who are US citizens or a green card, I think you have to have we could double check that. Um, but uh, if they're able to participate, uh, you know, and and help the campaign, we'd, we would love to have them uh, as long as they, you know, qualify, uh, which I assume almost everybody does. And it's a great way to tap in the U.S. market as well. I mean, if you are looking to do more business development and we, we need to do everything we can to beat Trump. You know, I mean, that's that's one of the things why I, uh, I you know, I want to figure out how I can continue to support what you're doing, um, because this is possibly one of the most important moments in you know my generation's lives so we got to do the right thing this, i would say this is this is the moment yeah, so uh and, and i guarantee the rest of the world is like rooting for for change um and i'll leave it with this when i left argentina and it wasn't just argentina but most countries around the world the u.s was at an all-time high in terms of favorability and 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 you know especially in argentina that's not easy uh sometimes for the u.s to perceive uh, to be perceived well and positive uh, at an all-time high. And so obviously that has dramatically changed in terms of perception of the United States for many reasons. So hopefully we can we can change that going forward. But I appreciate you having me and Thank you so uh, much now. what you're doing and we're going to have fun and we'll get past this. And Let's, we'll have a glass of wine when we uh, when we can when we can again. I know we I will. That. You got um, it. And then uh, for everyone tuning in, thank you so much for coming on. I know it was a might have been a weird hour in the middle of your day, depending on where you're at. We will be sending some information and uh, access to some events that Noah is going to be doing involving Biden as well. So uh, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks, Thanks. so much, Noah. Thank you. All Thanks. right. Take care. Bye.